Okay, so we are still talking about the Taiping Rebellion. Um, we'll take a different track than we did before. We talked yesterday about their economic programs. Today we're going to talk about how did Westerners or foreigners view Hong Xiuquan and the Taiping. Um, this is a fun one for me. We'll go into this. Um, remember the three M's that we talked about several lessons ago. Who were the three M's? The three different types of foreigners who were present in China at the time. We had merchants. These guys were mostly in the coastal cities, places like Canton, Shanghai, and they interacted with other merchants and business people. With the mercenaries, these were people that were interacting with the soldiers and the army. And we had the missionaries. And these were people who were starting to get into the countryside and interact with the peasants and the everyday people. So we're going to view over the next three days, three different missionary perspectives from different missionary type people that were there. Um, this one's cool for me because we're going to talk about Hosea Stout. This was my great, great grandfather's brother. Um, and he was a missionary in China. So let me show you pictures of the dude. There he is, dapper and handsome, right? There he is again. I love the side mullets. Crazy look in his eye a little later in life. Uh, this was a book that was published about him. There have been a couple of books. He was uh, so the first attorney general of the state of Utah. He moved to Utah when the state was just being founded with the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the Mormons, sometimes people call them. When they got driven out of Illinois, they set up in Utah, and he was part of setting up the government and everything there. He wrote letters back and forth to presidents and governors and people like that. So kind of a cool, famous dude. Now, he was sent to serve as a missionary. Um, that would happen in the church. You know, they'd say, hey, we need you to go spend six months being a missionary or whatever. And he got sent to China. It was not easy for him. It was a very difficult mission. Um, he and two other guys got in wagons, basically went to San Francisco, secured passage on a boat. They had to wait a couple of weeks until they could get, you know, a boat that was coming and everything. And they made their way to China and ended up in Hong Kong. They did have a couple of quick stops throughout China, but it became obvious that it wasn't going to be as easy to do their work there as it would in Hong Kong. And so he spent a little while there. It was a miserable few months. They didn't have much success. They had a really hard time going around trying to find people to teach them Chinese because that was actually illegal in the Qing dynasty. You could not teach Chinese to a foreigner. That wasn't allowed. Um, so they didn't have any success finding a teacher. Now, when he, he was there, his wife was pregnant. She died. Um, the kids were split up and sent to different relatives to live until he could get back. It, it wasn't good. And they threw in the towel after a few months and came home. Um, but when he got home, he gave a report on his mission time there. Now, I've got the full report that I will include as a PDF. You can read it if you're interested. We'll just look at some of the highlights here really quick. So he's going to talk right from here. And this is transcribed from a handwritten journal. That's why it's kind of the grammar's a little weird and stuff. He says there's a revolution going on there in China that keeps the country in considerable state of excitement. The foreign parties are all all time on the lookout and expecting that peradventure they will have to go to Hong Kong for safety. Why Hong Kong? Because the British will protect the island, right? Several ships kept on hand for that purpose. Those are British ships and anywhere there's a lot of foreigners like Shanghai or whatever, they keep these boats so if it gets too hot, you know, people jump on the ship and head to Hong Kong. I have no doubt what the rebellion will succeed. I have no doubt but what the Tartar dynasty will be overthrown. So when it says Tartar, most Westerners actually use that phrase wrong. Tartar refers to Mongolians. Well, the Qing were the Manchu, right? Manchuria is right next to Mongolia, and they were kind of nomadic people too. So that's why they call them the Tartars. No doubt but what the Tartar dynasty will be overthrown, and the ancient laws and systems of China will be established if foreign powers don't interfere. The rebel chief, so that would be Hong Xiuquan, does well while the emperor doesn't try to defend himself. The rebel chief says he is commanded by the God of heaven to set matters right to expel the Tartars and restore the ancient customs. When he gets the revelation to conquer provinces, and he always acts according to the decree and attacks in the name of God of heaven, it works very well, and he has kept his word so far, and I believe what effect will be after he does succeed, I can't tell. Um, we're going to start just a second video to clean up some more of his thoughts on this process, but we'll take it part two in just a moment. 